just over an hour. Good evening. I'm Jennifer Junta Hausler from the 92nd Street Wise Charles Simon Center for Adult Life and Learning. This lecture series is entitled The Culinary Experience. But as tonight's guest will tell us, the fast food experience has become about a lot more than what happens in the kitchen. Tonight, Eric Schlosser will tell us all and then sign copies of his book in the back of the room. Fast Food Nation has been on the New York Times bestseller list for 17 weeks and will soon be translated so that other countries can learn more about why American children often recognize the golden arches before they recognize their name. Eric Schlosser has worked as a journalist for many years, writing for Rolling Stone, and is currently a correspondent for Atlantic Monthly. He received a National Magazine Award for an article on marijuana written for Atlantic. If you didn't eat at McDonald's tonight, you may have missed out on your last Big Mac. Please welcome Eric Schlosser. Well, I'd like to thank you all for coming here tonight. Uh, there are a lot of other things to do in New York City on a Thursday night, and I'm very flattered that you've come to hear me. Um, I'd also like to thank the 92nd Street Y for having me here. Uh, the Y is one of America's great cultural treasures, and it really is an honor to be speaking here tonight. <coughs> tonight I'm going to talk about how I came to write Fast Food Nation, about some of the things I learned during the years that I was doing the research and the uh, reporting, about some of the costs of fast food that don't appear on the shiny backlit menus and about the future of this gigantic industry. Will McDonald's always be with us? Or will it someday disappear like American Motors and the Studebaker and Montgomery Ward? I, I'm not sure it always will be with us. First off, I should tell you a few things in the interest of uh, full disclosure. I don't own any stock in health food companies or organic supermarkets. And I'm not a vegetarian. I have a lot of respect for people who decide to become vegetarian for moral or ethical reasons, but I'm, I'm not one of them. I've visited some of the nation's biggest meatpacking plants and I've seen some of the appalling things that are happening inside them, and it didn't make me into a vegetarian. It made me angry, but it didn't make me into a vegetarian. My favorite meal remains a cheeseburger and fries and a chocolate shake. Though I haven't had one in a while. <laughs> I didn't set out to write a muckraking expose about the dark side of the all-American meal. I've eaten at McDonald's since I was a kid. I used to take my children to McDonald's and buy them Happy Meals, but I, I don't anymore. This book started as an assignment for Rolling Stone magazine. The editors asked me to look at America through its fast food, to go behind the counter and find out how this gigantic system that produces our fast food operates. These editors believed, and I wholeheartedly agree, that you can tell a lot about a country by what it eats and how it eats. When I took this assignment, I really didn't know anything about fast food. Like most people, I ate it, but never really thought about it. When I started this investigation, I had no idea how big and how powerful and how influential this industry has become. Now, of course, I knew that fast food isn't good for you. And I suspected that there was something fundamentally different about it. I think most of us realize that almost instinctively. Fast food tastes great while you're eating it, but then there's always this moment about 20 minutes after you're done, 
where there's some aftertaste and you wonder, what did I just eat? <laughs> the real turning point in my research was when someone gave me a pile of confidential documents from a McDonald's advertising campaign. The basic thinking behind this campaign seemed incredibly cynical and manipulative to me. There was really nothing cheery and happy about how they were planning to get parents and their children into their restaurants. And then I visited Greeley, Colorado, and I saw firsthand what's happening in the nation's meatpacking communities. And that's when the story became much darker for me. The Rolling Stone article ran in two parts, and it was very tough on this industry. Jan Winner, the editor of the magazine, never pressured me to tone the article down or cut things out or play it safe. And we never got sued by an industry that very much likes to sue its critics. But I felt after the article had run that there was a great deal I hadn't been able to include and that I'd really only scratched the surface of this industry and its enormous influence, not just on America, but on the rest of the world. What we eat and how our food is produced has changed more in the last 30 years than in the previous 30,000, without most of us realizing it. Today's fast food may look like food that we've always been eating, but it's really something quite different. It has been radically transformed. You have to look at fast food as though it's a manufactured industrial commodity, something much more like a toaster oven than like something that you would make from scratch and eat in your own kitchen. The fact is that we are now such an urban and suburbanized nation that most of us really have no idea how our food is made or where it comes from. Most of us have no idea what's going on at the farms and the ranches and the slaughterhouses and the processing plants that now feed us. And I think it's very important for people to know. Our great cities could not exist without the agricultural surplus of the countryside. New York City could not exist, Los Angeles, Chicago. They would not exist without the hard work and the ingenuity of America's ranchers and farmers. That sounds corny, but it's the truth, and it's something that's, that's easily forgotten in the year 2001. What happens on our farms and what happens to our farmers directly affects the rest of us. From the beginning of history, civilization, all civilization, has been made possible by agricultural surpluses. This is what allows some people to move off the land and live in cities. This is what allows government and science and the arts to flourish. We have lost sight of that basic fact of how the city and the suburb is fundamentally dependent on what's happening in the countryside. There is no industry more important than agriculture. No other industry can survive without agriculture. A hundred years ago, most people knew this. Most people either lived on a farm or had close relatives that lived on a farm. If you wanted a chicken for dinner, you had to go outside and grab one, chop off its head, pluck it, cook it in a pot. Now, some kids may find this hard to believe, but once upon a time, there were no chicken McNuggets. And in those days, there was something healthy and proper about being aware and being connected, directly connected to your food supply. Today, most of us grab shrink wrap packages of meat off the shelf at a supermarket or grab a plastic tray of food off the counter at a fast food restaurant without a moment's thought about how either one of those things got there. 
The main goal of my book is to make people think about these things, to show where fast food comes from and how it's made and how it's changed us. The fast food industry has helped to transform not just the American diet, but also our landscape, our economy, our workforce, our agriculture, and our popular culture. Fast food and its consequences are now unavoidable, whether you eat it every day or have never had a single bite of it. Now, I tried hard to write something that wouldn't be simplistic, something that wouldn't demonize this industry. I met a lot of good people in the fast food industry, people I liked, people who were well-intended. I don't think that the fast food industry right now is being run by a group of bad men who meet secretly every week and plot how to make us fatter and poison us. I don't believe that. I think the fast food industry is run by businessmen who are worried mainly about their next quarterly profit report, about their company's latest earnings per share, about what Wall Street will say about them, and not much else. These businessmen are not really worried about the long-term consequences of what they're selling or the impact on society. They're not really worried about what their products are doing to the health of America's children. They are focused on narrow, short-term goals measured in dollars and cents. And that's why we have to think hard about these consequences about the consequences of buying and selling and eating fast food. Because if we don't think about them, nobody will. Now, there are about 330 pages in my book, and only 10 of those pages give my opinion about what should be done and what changes need to be made to curb the worst abuses of the meatpacking and the fast food industries. The rest of the book is just straightforward, investigative reporting. There may be some mistakes in the book, and I'd very much like to hear what they are. The book was fact-checked and went through a very strict legal review. The fast food industry and the meatpacking industry have attacked me, and they've attacked the book, but thankfully so far they haven't pointed out any serious errors or factual errors in the book. And I haven't been sued yet for libel which is in itself no small thing. My aim was never to tell people what to think or how to feel about this subject. I didn't set out to lecture people about fast food or to act like a scold. You can read the book and keep eating fast food or read it and stop eating it. But I do believe quite strongly that you should know what you're putting into your mouth or into your children's mouths. So that's how and why I came to write the book. And now I'll give just a brief, a brief account of some of the things I learned. Firstly, let me give you a sense of how big the fast food industry is today. It's huge. This year, Americans will spend about $114 billion on fast food. That's more money than they'll spend on higher education, personal computers, computer software, or new cars. Americans now spend more money on fast food than on movies, books, magazines, newspapers, videos, and CDs combined. A few facts about McDonald's will give you a sense of this industry's scale and its power. McDonald's isn't just the largest fast food company. It's really set the standard for the rest of the industry. Its business practices are widely imitated, not just within the fast food industry, but also by companies in very different fields. McDonald's is a colossus. It is America's largest purchaser of beef, pork, and potatoes, the second largest purchaser of chicken. The McDonald's Corporation is the largest owner of retail property in the world. The company earns most of its money not from selling hamburgers, but from collecting rent. 
McDonald's now spends more money on advertising and promotion than any other brand. It has replaced Coca-Cola as the world's most famous brand. McDonald's is one of the nation's largest playground operators and one of the largest distributors of toys. A survey of American school children found that 96% could identify Ronald McDonald. The only fictional character with a higher degree of recognition was Santa Claus. The impact of McDonald's on the way we live today is hard to overstate. The Golden Arches are now more widely recognized than the Christian cross. Fast food has become ubiquitous. It is literally everywhere, an unavoidable part of modern life. More than one out of every four Americans eat at a fast food restaurant every day. We tend to take fast food for granted, as though it's always been around, but it really hasn't. The first McDonald's restaurant opened in 1948. In two decades, the company built 3,000 restaurants. So in 1968, there were 3,000 McDonald's, and all of them were in the United States. Today, there are about 30,000 McDonald's, and the company opens 2,000 new ones, roughly, every year. The enormous growth of the fast food industry started, really, around 1970. It accelerated in the 1980s, and it hit its peak in the mid-1990s. And there was nothing inevitable about this. The growth of the fast food industry didn't occur in a political and a social vacuum. The extraordinary growth in fast food occurred during a period when the hourly wage of the average American worker was declining. During this period, women were entering the workforce in large numbers, not mainly because of feminism, but in order to help pay their families' bills. During this period, sophisticated mass marketing techniques were being aimed at children for the first time, and the fast food industry, and McDonald's in particular, has pioneered marketing and selling things to children. Also, during this same period, the real value of the minimum wage plummeted by 40 percent. And it's hardly a coincidence that the fast food industry's biggest period of growth occurred when the minimum wage was falling so far. In the book, I look at how the chains have really helped change how Americans work. Now, when the McDonald brothers opened their brand new restaurant, the first McDonald's in San Bernardino, more than 50 years ago, they came up with a whole new way of preparing food. They brought the assembly line system from factories into a commercial kitchen. And instead of relying on skilled short order cooks, who you had to pay decent wage to, they broke up all the different tasks in the kitchen so that one worker did the same thing again and again and again. One person would flip hamburgers all day. One person would make french fries all day, etc., etc. And in this system, it didn't really matter who got bored and who quit because you could easily find someone to replace him or her because there was so little skill involved in the job. A new worker was easy and inexpensive to put into such a job. Now, in this system, nobody is irreplaceable. What matters most isn't any individual or any individual skills. It's the system. And it's the details of the operating system that govern everything. Now, when Richard and Mac McDonald came up with this, they, they weren't trying to change the world. They didn't see any of the bigger implications or ramifications of what they were doing in their little kitchen in San Bernardino. They were just trying to cut costs in their kitchen. But the repercussions of using that system in one restaurant is really different from the repercussions when there are over 200,000 restaurants 
operating that way. And that's how many fast food restaurants there are in the States today. The restaurant industry is now America's biggest private employer. So what the restaurant industry does with its workers has enormous implications for every other industry. Well, the restaurant industry now pays some of the lowest wages in the United States. On average, only migrant farm workers earn less money in America than restaurant workers. And so the influence of the McDonald brothers has gone beyond the fast food industry into other industries that, that have looked at this system for employing people and have copied it. And you'll find throughout the service economy now, companies are borrowing from McDonald's and borrowing from the fast food industry. The workforce that McDonald's cultivated, part-time, low-paid, unskilled, unlikely to stay on the job for very long, unlikely to ever join a union, unable to demand any real benefits, is the workforce that is increasingly spreading through the U.S. economy. Now, in the book, I look at how the fast food chains have helped to transform the American landscape, literally have changed what American cities and suburbs look like. It was Ray Kroc who had the idea to take what the McDonald brothers were doing in this one restaurant in San Bernardino and reproduce it exactly and identically at location after location after location. And it was really the fast food industry in McDonald's that pioneered this whole idea of taking retail environments and replicating them throughout the country um, as a way of growing your business. Now, Ray Kroc founded the McDonald's Corporation, and uh, he eventually got rid of the McDonald brothers um, because they, he found them difficult to work with. The key to the success of McDonald's, according to Ray Kroc, could be described in one word, conformity. Quote, we have found out that we cannot trust some people who are nonconformists, Kroc once said about some McDonald's restaurant operators. We will make conformists out of them in a hurry. The organization cannot trust the individual. The individual must trust the organization. Now that sensibility is at the heart not just of how the fast food industry spreads, but of franchising and of all the other chain stores that have adopted its methods. So it was Kroc who made sure, fanatically, that McDonald's restaurants always looked the same and that the food in them always tasted exactly the same. Now, other industries, as I mentioned, copy this. The founders of The Gap, for example, were quite open about how they wanted to sell clothing the way that McDonald's and KFC sold food. As a result, when you travel through this country, and it's, it's, it's hard to remember how recent it is, it's really only in the last 20, 25 years, you now see the same restaurants and the same stores and the same retail strips wherever you go. The differences between north and south and east and west are rapidly disappearing, driven by this conformity. Ray Kroc's belief in conformity has left an indelible mark not only on this country, but more and more on the rest of the world. And when you go to suburban areas in the United Kingdom or in Germany or in France, you will see Walmart and KFC and McDonald's and very similar strips beginning to pop up. Now in the book I look at how the fast food industry has transformed the food that we eat and how it's produced. Till the early 1960s everything at McDonald's was made from scratch. The ground beef was fresh, the potatoes were fresh, they were peeled in the back of the restaurant every day. But as the chain grew, and because of Kroc's desire to have everything taste exactly the same at every location, 
The company began to rely more and more on frozen foods and on processed foods. Instead of buying ground beef from almost 200 different suppliers, McDonald's started buying its beef from less than half a dozen. This had a profound effect on America's meatpacking industry. So as the fast food industry got bigger, so did its suppliers, encouraging concentration throughout American agriculture. Now in a different era, when this was happening, when one big company was merging with another, the federal government would have stepped in and prevented it. Even in the Eisenhower era, the government would have prevented many of these huge mergers from taking place. But thanks in large part to the fast food industry, American food processors now have more power over American farmers and ranchers than at any other time in our history. Farmers are being driven off the land in record numbers. Indeed, the United States now has more prison inmates than full-time farmers. Today's agricultural economy looks like an hourglass. At the top, there are about a million and a half farmers and ranchers. At the bottom, there are about 275 million consumers who eat what the ranchers and the farmers produce. And in the middle, in the very, very narrow place in the middle, there are about a dozen big agribusiness firms that are earning money on every transaction between the two and really controlling those transactions. Now, fast food is some of the most heavily processed food on the planet. Almost everything in a fast food restaurant arrives there frozen or dehydrated or as syrup. There is very, very little cooking that goes on in these places, and that's deliberate. For the most part, what's happening in a fast food kitchen is frozen food is being reheated. Frozen food is cheaper to buy, and it's much cheaper to hire workers who only have to reheat things and don't actually have to prepare them or cook them. Now the problem with the system that relies on processed food is that when you process food, when you freeze it and dehydrate it, you destroy most of its flavor. And one of the most mind-blowing things for me as I was doing this research was coming upon a flavor industry that has arisen to manufacture the taste, not just of most of the fast food that we eat, but most of the processed food that you'll buy at supermarkets today. This flavor industry is, is really a branch of the specialty chemical industry. And the heart of the industry is, is right nearby. It's off the New Jersey Turnpike uh, in New Jersey. Most of the flavor for most of the fast food that we eat is coming from this uh, industrial corridor off the uh, New Jersey Turnpike. Now, one of the chapters in my book set out to discover why McDonald's french fries taste so good. And they really do. I mean, they have a very distinctive flavor that's different from just about all the other fries that the chains sell. And the reason is this one ingredient at the back of the, the very end of the list of ingredients, you'll see this phrase, natural flavor. And um, it is a natural flavor. I, I had to really try and figure out where it comes from. And uh, it turns out it comes from animal products and uh, from beef. Uh, there's all kinds of strange things that are being added to our fast food uh, that most people don't realize. Chicken McNuggets derive much of their flavor from beef and from beef extracts. And uh, there are all kinds of really unusual chemicals that are going into these flavor additives. And I'm just going to read you the beginning of, of a list, for example, of a, of a strawberry flavor. Um, and what's in it? Uh, a typical artificial strawberry flavor, like the kind that you'll find in a Burger King strawberry milkshake, contains the following ingredients. Amyl acetate, amyl butyrate, amyl valerate, anethol, 
anisulformate, benzyl acetate, benzyl isobutyrate, butyric acid, cinnamol isobutyrol, and about 35 to 40 other chemicals that have that name. Now, by law, the FDA doesn't require these companies to list the ingredients in a flavor additive. Um, but if they had to, the ingredients in these flavor additives uh, often outnumber, usually outnumber, the ingredients in the food itself. Now, there's not anything necessarily dangerous about these chemicals, um, but there's really something strange about them, about this whole system, about these flavor factories off the turnpike. And for me, this is important, not because I wanted to make people scared of their food or scared of these chemicals, but really to show them that this fast food is a very different creature, literally. It's an industrial product, a manufactured product. And for me, this is a very important symbol of how our whole food supply has been transformed in the last 30 years. Now, the fast food chains have changed not only what Americans eat, but also what Americans look like. It's hardly a coincidence that as fast food consumption has risen in the United States, so has people's weight. The rate of obesity among American adults has more than doubled since the early 1960s. Now, our obesity epidemic has many complex causes, but there's little doubt that fast food is one of them. Um, human beings have an instinctive craving for fat. It comes from thousands and thousands of years of scarcity, of food scarcity, when it was really a struggle to survive. And we developed very efficient mechanisms for putting on fat and keeping it for the lean periods. Um, we're not very good at losing the fat once it's put on us. Um, fast food is some of the fattiest, uh, high salt, high, high sugar food that's sold in the United States. And this isn't accidental. Um, the amount of fat in fast food is very carefully designed and very, ca very carefully calibrated uh, to make you want to eat more of it. So this industry is really uh, addressing a basic human craving and making an enormous amount of money off of it. Uh, the portion sizes have also increased dramatically in the last five to ten years because the concentration in agriculture has pushed down the price of the food so much that these companies can now offer you a much bigger serving and, and still make a huge profit on it. Uh, when you get a large order of French fries, there's just a few pennies worth of potatoes in it. So they can give you a larger serving and, and make a lot more uh, by charging you an extra 20 to 30 cents. They're only giving you one or two more cents worth of potatoes. And that's true for the sodas also, which are really where they make most of their profit. Uh, these supersized sodas that they're selling are, are basically pure profit. Uh, the only cost that they have is the cost of the cup and uh, the syrup, which is basically sugar and cost a few pennies. So it's been extremely profitable for these companies to increase their portion size, but it's had an enormous effect on American eating habits and especially on the eating habits of the poorest Americans who eat the most fast food. Now, if an adult wants to buy a double cheeseburger with bacon and a supersized fries and a supersized Coke, it's a free country, and I think that's great. People should go right ahead. Um, but one of the real problems that we're facing today is obesity among children and the way the fast food chains are marketing these same high fat foods to children. And to me, that's a very, very different subject entirely. The obesity rate among American children has doubled since the late 1970s. And we have the highest obesity rate among children in the Western industrialized world. There are children now who are suffering uh, from early onset diabetes in large numbers. Um, there are children who are six to eight years old who are having heart attacks because of their obesity. Um, the fast food chains from the very early days have worked hard to market their goods to kids. Ray Kroc, again, really pioneered this. 
And it wasn't because he loved kids. It was because he realized, and he's quite open in his memoir about this, that if you can get a child to come to your restaurant, you'll also get one, two of their parents, grandparents. And the industry's own surveys now show that whenever a child gets, sets foot in a fast food restaurant, the average check size is much higher just because that child is bringing in other customers. So the fast food industry, and, and McDonald's in particular, has really pioneered very sophisticated marketing techniques aimed at children. Um, and that's to get them and their parents in the restaurant. Uh, there are tie-ins with the leading toy manufacturers, tie-ins with the leading Hollywood studios. And it's, it's very hard now to distinguish America's fast food culture from the popular culture of its children. Um, if you look at what's in Happy Meals and in Burger King children meals, though, it's extremely high-fat food. And the trend in the industry right now is to actually make the portions even bigger. Uh, McDonald's has just introduced something called a Mighty Kids Meal, which has a bigger burger. And, uh, and so um, this is a major, major issue facing the industry. And it's very different. Um, from selling this kind of food to adults. Now, a very big part of the book, and one of the parts that I think is, is one of the most important, looks at the meatpacking industry in America and how the fast food chains have really helped to recreate this meatpacking industry to serve their needs. In 1970, Really, at the dawn of the fast food industry, the top four meat packers controlled about 20% of the market for beef. Today, the top four meat packing companies control about 85% of the beef that's being sold in the United States. Um, there's never been this much concentrated power in the meat packing industry, going back even 100 years ago to the days of Upton Sinclair. These companies, these meatpacking companies, are very powerful and they are very tough. And they have recruited a workforce that in many ways is very similar to that of the fast food industry. Um, and I'm going to get into that a little bit later. But the, the centralized meatpacking system that we have, uh, largely, to ser largely to serve the interests of the fast food industry, has also become a very effective mechanism for taking dangerous pathogens and all kinds of bugs that cause food poisoning and spreading them throughout the United States. Uh, 25 years ago, there were hundreds of slaughterhouses in the United States. And today, there are 13 that produce most of the beef that Americans consume. Um, there has been a huge rise uh, in the last few decades in uh, foodborne illness, according to the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. Not all of that is due to fast food, but this centralized, industrialized system is a perfect way to spread disease. Every day in the United States, about 200,000 people get a bad case of food poisoning, 900 are hospitalized, and 14 die. And we're finding that there are all kinds of new pathogens that are entering this food system, like E. coli, 0157H7, and listeria, that we didn't even know existed until about 20 years ago. Studies have found that bouts of food poisoning not only involve the acute phase of illness when you're really feeling terrible, but can have lasting, lifelong physical effects. Now, the outbreak of mad cow in the United Kingdom is one more example of a pathogen that no one had ever heard of and no one had ever anticipated entering the food supply and spreading throughout the system before anyone realized it. And that's what our meatpacking system has really made possible. The meatpacking companies and the fast food companies in the last 20 years have formed very, very close alliances with the right wing uh, of the Republican Party and have an enormous amount of power uh, in Congress. 
As a result, at the same time that the industry was becoming very concentrated and the potential for large-scale outbreaks was increasing, uh, our federal public health system and food safety has system was largely being uh, dismantled. At the moment, there are about a dozen different federal agencies that are responsible for food safety and more than two, different, two dozen congressional subcommittees that oversee them. There are huge gaps uh, in enforcement. Most people would be surprised to learn that the federal government right now has the authority to demand the recall of defective stuffed animals, but cannot order the recall of contaminated meat that could potentially sicken thousands, if not mil millions of people. Right now, all recalls of meat are voluntary. And while the government is negotiating with a meat packing company over how much meat does need to be recalled, uh, that meat remains on the market and people continue eating it. Now, the question that I've gotten most from people after writing this book has been, so what's in my burger? And the answer is, if it's a fast food burger, uh, there are probably pieces of dozens, if not hundreds of different cattle in that burger because of the huge hamburger grinders that now grind thousands and thousands of animals together. And uh, there may be some feces in it. Most of the outbreaks of food poisoning related to meat are caused by fecal contamination of the meat at these slaughterhouses. If you cook it well, it probably won't harm you. And I go in, I, I explore at length in the book all the different foodborne illnesses that are now being spread uh, through this industrialized system. But it was not my intention um, to make people afraid of their food. There are a lot of things to worry about, and you shouldn't necessarily be afraid of your hamburger. Um, the odds are it won't make you sick, but the odds are somebody's going to get sick from that. Uh, every year, about 100,000 Americans come down with this bad E. coli, this very serious E. coli infection. So to statistically, it won't be one of you, but it's going to be someone. And it's really important to be informed about what's happening and also, as I discussed in the book, how unnecessary so much of this is. And with, how, with, with stricter regulation of the meatpacking industry and stricter food safety laws, uh, nowhere near as many people would be getting sick. What stays with me the most from all my reporting for this book uh, were my visits to meatpacking communities. And again, there's been an enormous change in the last 20 years in what's happened in meatpacking plants and in, to meatpacking workers. A hundred years ago, Upton Sinclair wrote about the extremely dangerous conditions in meatpacking. But things got better. Over the course of decades, things got much better in meatpacking plants in the United States. And by the early 1970s, meatpacking was one of the highest paid industrial jobs in the United States with one of the lowest turnover rates. It was a good job. There were waiting lists for jobs in American meatpacking plants. And, as, and then as the meatpacking industry became concentrated, and as these four companies, really three companies, wielded enormous power over the industry, they began to break labor unions, one after another. And they be, began to change the nature of meatpacking jobs. And they began to recruit a whole new type of worker, really Mexican and Guatemalan uh, workers, many of them illegal immigrants. So if you go into a meatpacking plant today, you will find some of the poorest, often illiterate workers in the United States working in a job that is unpleasant and dangerous beyond my powers of description. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, today meatpacking is the most dangerous job in the United States. In 1999, more than one quarter of America's meatpacking workers suffered an on-the-job injury or illness. 
And that means something more serious than just going to get first aid. The meatpacking industry not only has the highest injury rate, it has the highest rate of serious injuries as measured in lost work days. Now, if you accept the official figures, that means about 40,000 meatpacking workers are injured every year. But there's very good reason to believe those numbers are low and that the actual numbers are much, much higher because of how vulnerable this workforce is, how rarely the injuries are being reported, and, uh, and the falsification of, uh, of injury reports. So, to give you a sense of what's going on in these plants, I'm going to read off a list of some accident reports from OSHA, some meatpacking accident reports. Okay, great. And these will give you a sense of what's going on. Employee severely burned after fuel from his saws ignited. Employee hospitalized for neck laceration from flying blade. Employee's finger amputated in chitlin machine. Employee's fingers amputated in meat blender. Employee's arm amputated when caught in meat tenderizer. Employee killed when arm caught in unguarded meat grinder. Employee killed when head crushed by conveyor. Employee killed by stun gun. Employee crushed and killed in hide fleshing machine. Employee caught and killed in gut cooker machine. Now most of the injuries that are happening aren't this extreme. Most of them are lacerations, people stabbing themselves or stabbing someone nearby. But the injury rate is astronomical. And one of the things that I realized is that there are many other countries that eat meat and eat beef and produce beef in slaughterhouses and don't have anywhere near the working conditions that we have and don't have anywhere near the injury rate that we have. Now, one of the big criticisms of my book after it came out was that it was overly critical of the Republican Party and one-sided in its criticism of the Republican Party. Well, the fact of the matter is that for the last 20 years, the Republican Party has worked very closely with the fast food industry and with the meatpacking industry to avoid tough worker safety laws and food safety laws and has really worked to avoid the sort of regulations that would keep real competition in our agricultural markets. I'll give you an example. In the new Republican Congress, Representative Charles Norwood has jurisdiction over OSHA, which is the federal agency that looks after the safety of workers. Now, Norwood right now is in charge in Congress of OSHA. Well, in the past, Congressman Norwood has introduced legislation to abolish OSHA. One of the most serious problems in meatpacking today are cumulative trauma injuries, which happen when you do the same task over and over again. The meatpacking industry has the highest rate of cumulative trauma of any industry. It's about 35 times higher than that of any other, uh, than of the average in industry. Well, Representative uh, Congressman Norwood has publicly said that workers tend to get cumulative trauma injuries not from their jobs, but from playing too much tennis and from skiing. <laughs> so it's hard not to be critical of the Republican Party. I'm not a Democrat. I'm a registered independent. And ideally, all of these issues involving food would be dealt with in a nonpartisan spirit, sincerely. It doesn't matter whether you're a Republican or a Democrat. You have to eat, and so do your children. Although Democrats in recent years have worked for food safety and, and, and for worker safety legislation and have taken on the meatpacking industry, it was a Republican president 
a hundred years ago, almost, who really was America's greatest champion of food safety. It was a Republican. Theodore Roosevelt had the nerve to battle the meatpacking industry, and not just the meatpacking industry, but to really take on the concentration of economic power in this country. And unfortunately, almost a century later, there really is a need to battle these same forces once again. So I hope the Republican Party will soon reclaim this great Republican tradition. The 20th century was largely characterized by a battle against totalitarian power, state power, fascism, communism. And I think that this century, this new century, is going to be dominated by a battle against excessive corporate power worldwide. Um, it's not just in the fast food industry or the meatpacking industry. It's remarkable how similar our economic landscape is becoming to that of 1901. And when I was in these meatpacking communities in Colorado and Nebraska and in Texas, it didn't feel in many ways like 2001. It felt like 100 years ago. So the question is, will McDonald's always be with us? I'm not so sure. It seems hard to believe. There's so many of them. They're everywhere. You can't escape them. And yet, I think they're built on a very fragile base. There's a quote I have in the book from a leading fast food executive about the industry's fundamental dynamic, which is grow or die. And the industry isn't really growing in the United States anymore. As a matter of fact, the year 2000 is the first year that the fast food industry didn't get any new customers in the United States. And as a result, they focused all of their energies on expanding overseas and opening in every country that they po possibly can. But their sales overseas now are starting to slow. And it may be, and I hope I'm not being overly optimistic, that the fast food industry right now is like the British Empire right before the First World War. It looked huge. It straddled the globe. But at heart, at its core, there were some fundamental contradictions that would lead to its undoing. Now, the British Empire still exists. It's just very small. It's Gibraltar and uh, the Falkland Islands. And in the same way, the fast food industry, I think, is either going to have to change to adapt to changing conditions in the new century, or it's going to get smaller, much smaller. I mean, what the book tries to look at is all the costs of our cheap food that don't appear on the menu. And I think those costs are enormous. The costs of obesity are twice as high as the total revenues of the fast food industry. So as be people become more aware of what they're eating and what their consequences, I think there's enormous potential for change. Now, I've spent a lot of time uh, holding the fast food industry responsible for a lot of these business practices. But it's really not that simple. Um, I think people have to take responsibility for their own purchases and for their own behavior. Nobody is forced to buy fast food. And this industry exists really at the pleasure of consumers. So, you know, the future is really in every individual's hands. I mean, you can keep on eating it or you can stop buying it. And it's really one of the last remaining instances of you can really have it your way. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. OK. Um, the first question is, is it from an ethical point of view or how the food is processed that convince you not to let your children eat at McDonald's? Um, 
it's it's mainly from an ethical point of view. Um, I don't want to give money or support a company whose business is practices right now. Um, I strongly oppose. The power of McDonald's is enormous, and they could change the conditions and the working conditions in the meatpacking industry like that if, uh, if they told their suppliers to change. Their suppliers in the meatpacking industry will completely change production uh, practices to suit McDonald's in other ways. So it's not that I'm worried about my children being sickened by the food. It's not wanting to involve them in this system and give money to a company that I'm angry at. Uh, if you had to pick out one fast food chain to patronize, which would it be? Uh, that's an easy one. There's a great chain. It's called In-N-Out Burger. It's mainly in Southern California, Northern California, Nevada. And the way that In-N-Out Burger operates really shows that the rest of the industry has no excuse for its business practices. In-N-Out Burger uses entirely fresh food. Uh, they pay their workers the highest wages in the industry. Uh, their, their restaurant managers, on average, stay working for in and out for at least, uh, the average tenure is about 12 years, whereas in the fast food industry, the typical manager quits or is fired every year. And the typical in and out restaurant manager earns about $80,000 a year. So it would definitely be in and out burger. And the food tastes great, and, and I'm not being paid by them for this plug. Um, I have not been able to eat a hamburger since reading your book. <laughs> and I love hamburgers. Is there no place in New York City where it's safe to eat one other than my own kitchen? Well, unfortunately, my favorite food, as I said earlier, is a cheeseburger. And I've been in these plants now, and, and I'm not eating ground beef at the moment. And it's... It's not necessarily because I'm scared that it's going to make me sick. It's that I'm very angry at some of the practices that are creating our ground beef. Um, there are many different issues. One of them is E. coli. Uh, but one of them is also some of the spinal cord material that's being included in a lot of ground beef, legally included in ground beef. And I think people, and especially children, shouldn't be fed spinal cord material um, and bone marrow with their ground beef. Um, so is there anywhere that's safe? The odds are if you go out and get a burger right now, you can eat it and, and nothing will happen to you. But if you really, really want to know what you're eating, the best way to eat a burger is buy a really good cut of meat, bring it home, put it in the Cuisinart, and cook it up. Um, but at the moment, I'm not eating ground beef. Uh, have you had any feedback from the meatpacking industry since the publication of your book? Uh, yes, they, um, they didn't like the book. <laughs> they really didn't. And, uh, uh, and they have been very personally critical of me. But I've said this a number of times, and I don't want to be tempting fate, but they love to sue their critics, as Oprah Winfrey learned, and thus far I've, I've avoided that. So the criticism so far has been light compared to what other people um, have received. Has there been a backlash from McDonald's? If so, how have you handled it? Um, uh, McDonald's has also criticized me and the book, and um, I've handled it by ignoring it. <laughs> uh, what kinds of foods, meat products, at fast food restaurants are safest to eat? Um, probably those chicken nuggets with that little extra beef flavoring in them. I mean, I, I'm, you know, it's a question of is it safe to eat in the moment or is it good for you to eat in the long term? And most of this food at fast food restaurants is safe to eat uh, in the moment. Um, they've done a pretty good job at fast food restaurants of getting the E. coli out of the ground beef before it arrives at the restaurant. The dirtiest ground beef is now being sent to supermarkets and until recently was being sold to American schools. But, but still, um, you know, it's, it's, it's more of a long-term worry than if you're starving and you go into a fast food restaurant, you'll probably be just fine. Um, what kinds of foods... Oh, I did that one. Uh, what are you going to write about next? Um, 
I'm going to write about another cheery American topic, <laughs> which is prisons. And frozen food for the most part. Um, in many upscale towns, McDonald's have been made to look different. No arches. Uh, have they expended much effort and money to fight towns over this? Um, you know, McDonald's has learned over the years when there will be a great deal of protest about one of their restaurants and when there probably won't be and, and where it might be a problem and where it might not. And so they have made a real effort in certain situations to make their McDonald's blend in uh, to urban centers. Um, and certainly when there's, a, when there's a risk of a protest, they've worked even harder. Uh, when you're talking about a new McDonald's in, on a suburban strip or on the fringes of, uh, of new suburban sprawl, um, they will pretty much put up whatever, whatever they care to put up. But they have spent time and, and taken great effort in recent years to make their restaurants blend in better. Uh, why isn't the low cost of labor counterbalanced by the high cost of transporting the processed ingredients? Um, one of the things I look at in the book is how this industry and these industries that are so openly committed uh, to the free market and to free market uh, principles have actually been heavily subsidized by the federal government in all kinds of ways. Uh, one of those ways is the interstate highway system. And the interstate highway system has made it very inexpensive. Uh, to transport agricultural commodities in bulk over long distance. I mean, we're talking about pennies, uh, uh, pennies per, per mile. And so, um, and so transportation costs are, are not a problem with these big, huge food factories. Uh, this is a comment about MSG and, and monosodium glutamate. Uh, obesity comes from excess sugar, not from fat. If natural fat, the problem, the fat, the problem is the fat they're using is hydrogenated vegetable oils. And I can't, I can't read, I can't read all of this, I'm sorry. When you, when you use the word natural flavor, yeah. they can name it that natural flavor, but basically it's MSG. I don't think that you can put natural flavor, but there are different phrases like autolyzed yeast protein. There are different ways to, to, to hide the, the MSG that's in it. The natural flavor that you talk about, the extract from beef, is at MSG. Hmm. And it's very dangerous in children. In adults, it can make you a little sick, but not as much. Hmm. In children, it's very dangerous. Um, did you have any chance to learn about sugar processing in your research and how they depend on the meat industry? Um, no, I didn't. Uh, it's not something I know very much about. Uh, you started by talking about the importance of agriculture to the U.S. economy. Uh, perhaps you know the book, The End of Agriculture in the American Portfolio, saying that agriculture is over. Um, could you comment on this range of perspectives together with the ongoing loss of farmland all over the U.S.? Um, I don't think that 
agriculture is over. And I think that we've pursued a very short-sighted policy in this country that has really benefited uh, large agribusiness companies at the expense of farmers. Um, I think that Western Europe is increasingly moving away from this system. Um, the mad cow scare there and now foot and mouth has really brought up there uh, and brought to mind in the way in, in Europe in the way it hasn't happened here the dangers of large-scale industrialized corporate agriculture. So you have Germany right now, the government in Germany is officially committed to the deindustrialization of agriculture and is working very hard to support organic agriculture, but also regional farmer, small-scale based agriculture. And I think that if you add all the costs up together um, without having to return to horse-drawn plows, uh, that's really the direction that this country needs to, uh, to head in as well, which is much smaller scale and much reg more regionally based agriculture. And that's it. Thank you very much. Schlosser's book is published by Houghton Mifflin Company. For more information, you can visit their website at hmco.com.